My heart exalts in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth derides my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. There is none holy like the Lord, for there is none besides you. There is no rock like our God. Talk no more so very proudly. Let not arrogance come from your mouth, for the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by Him actions are weighed. The Lord kills and brings to life. He brings down to Seol and raises up. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and He exalts. He raises up the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes and inherit a seat of honor. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and on them He has set the world. He will guard the feet of His faithful ones, but the wicked shall be cut off in darkness, for not by might shall a man prevail. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Against them He will thunder in heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to His King and exalt the horn of His anointed.
our dear Heavenly Father, who safeguards our hearts and minds. Our hearts and minds continue to be troubled as we keep on receiving news locally and internationally on how COVID has struck people around the world. Our hearts continue to ache for friends, family members, fellow citizens, and people around the world who suffered, still suffering, and lost their loved ones. Forgive us, Father, as we could not help but be mindful of the news. Forgive us for being anxious of our friends and family who have contracted COVID. Forgive us for losing hope, peace, and strength whenever we receive news of someone we know who had passed away. So, we come humbly before you and present all the things that have troubled us, all the things that we are anxious of, and all the things that we are suffering from. Lord God, we want to seek your peace that transcends all understanding, the peace that only you can give. This is the kind of peace that will keep our hearts and minds safe from the distresses that COVID-19 have brought upon us. Lord, teach us to find joy in all circumstances and to count the blessings that you have bestowed us in spite of the unfavorable situation we are all in. Remind us that we can always come to you for anything, that you will always be with us no matter what the circumstances are. Help us to wait patiently upon you because you listen to our prayers and cries for help, because you will lift us out of the pit of despair and will set our feet on solid ground. It is for these reasons that we can say with confidence, let my soul be at rest again, for the Lord has been good to me. Lord, guard our hearts and minds with your peace as we live in Christ Jesus. Help us to rejoice in the Lord always. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace and the Source of Joy, we pray. Amen. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. my 
A blessed Sunday to all of you, brothers and sisters in Christ. I remember the year I first became a Christian. I was in first year high school and I started joining our student fellowship here in UECP. And I always have to hitch, uh, to hitch a ride home through our church service because I live quite far away from church. And I can still remember vividly uh, one time a lady rode with us on the way home. And because I'm always the last to be dropped off, I was able to converse with the lady at the back of the L300. Dati, L3 pa, hindi pa van. And I found out that she is a missionary. I didn't know what a missionary was back then because I was new to the faith. So I remember asking her a lot of questions. And before she got off the church car, she handed me a sheet of paper. It was printed like a newspaper. And the title says, A Network. A Network. She told me to read it and, uh, when I get home and consider to be one of her prayer partners. So when I got home, I, imme I immediately read it. And it was full of thanksgiving. And it reported there what she she has been doing in her ministry. A, dec uh, a dec decade later, I learned that the lady I talked to was one of our supported missionaries. Her name is Annette. And the piece of paper she gave me, which I actually kept for a few years, was a missionary support letter or a missionary newsletter. A letter missionaries give to their supporters and prayer partners to update them of what the Lord has been doing through their ministry. The reason I'm telling you this story is to give you an idea what Paul's epistle to the Philippian church is. It is actually what we can consider today as a missionary newsletter. Paul just received a generous support from the Philippian church, the first church he actually planted during his first missionary journey, and he wants them to know how he is doing. He wants them to know how happy he is to hear from them and how joyful he is in their partnership with him in the ministry. And that is what makes this epistle so unique from Paul's other letters. It is full of rejoicing and thanksgiving as compared to his other letters. Of course, it also includes teachings, warnings, and doctrines because Paul considers himself their spiritual father. But the heart of the epistle always goes back to rejoicing. Either Paul talking about his joy or what he rejoices about, or he is exhorting the Philippians to rejoice. 
Actually, in this very short letter, he mentioned the word joy or rejoice 14 times. 14 times. And he says it again even until the closing section of his letter. He says, rejoice. So, let us open our Bibles and read about it in Philippians chapter 4, verse 4 to 7. Let's open our Bibles and read together. Philippians 4, verse 4 to 7. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. In his letter to his beloved church, he tells them repeatedly to rejoice. Rejoice. Why? Is there something to rejoice about? Are there any reasons to rejoice? Today, in, this, in the midst of this awful pandemic, it is so hard to tell people to rejoice. When people are suffering, when people are dying, how can we honestly tell them, rejoice? Does Paul's letter to the Philippians and his exhortation to rejoice applicable for us today? Well, let me tell you, Paul himself was not in a very comfortable situation either. He was actually being held in house arrest when he wrote this letter. Just like us, he was actually on lockdown. And just like us, his life was in constant danger as well. His life was not only threatened by the Jews, but he was also facing imminent execution. And yet, being in such a dangerous situation, he's telling the Philippian church, and he's telling us today, that in Christ, there is always reason to rejoice. In Christ, there is always reason to rejoice. So, brothers and sisters, let's keep our Bible open to Philippians, and let us learn what we can, where we can find the same joy and learn how to rejoice, even in the midst of this terrible pandemic. For Paul says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. The first question we want to ask is, where to find joy? What should be the source of our joy? I sometimes hear people say, find your happy place. Or when you're sad, go to your happy place. During this pandemic, during this time of pandemic and lockdown, many of us miss our favorite vacation destination. And when we are so bored and sad at home, it is so nice to reminisce going to these places. To some, their happy place might be the beach. To some, maybe in another country. Or to some, their happy place is their favorite restaurant. But for Paul, there's only one place where he finds joy. Actually, for him, joy does not come from a place, but from a person. And that is in his, in his Lord, Jesus Christ. That is why he says, rejoice in the Lord. What does Paul mean when he says, rejoice in the Lord? How can we better understand this statement? He actually first said this exact same statement in the beginning of chapter 3. Let's go back and look at it. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 1, he says, Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. After saying this, he began to warn the Philippians against the Judaizers, false teachers who put their confidence on the flesh, and probably forcing the Philippians church to do the same. Pastor Benson mentioned it last week. They were those who teach us finding righteousness and salvation by observing the Mosaic law instead of trusting fully in Jesus Christ alone. Paul tells the Philippians church that these are worthless. He says, he says, this, not be, he says this not because he is bitter of not having it. In fact, in following the Mosaic law, he is considered, Paul is considered a top-notcher. 
And in Philippians, he lists them down all of his a- achievements or all his accolades. But then he tells the Philippian church that he considers them rubbish or trash or dung or in other words, poop. Yes, that is what Paul really meant when he said rubbish. And he considers all his accomplishments rubbish as compared to knowing Christ and having Christ in his life. Here is what he said in Philippians 3 verse 8. It says, Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. And he continued on. He says, And be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead." You see, for Paul, what brings him great joy is knowing Jesus. For him, the greatest thing in life is Jesus. The world only offers temporary happiness, but true joy can only be found in knowing Christ. To be found righteous through the grace of God in Jesus and to experience the resurrection of Jesus in his life. It is his relationship with his Lord and Savior Jesus that gives Paul joy. Nothing else can even compare. Nothing else comes close. As I have said earlier, people try to find happiness in different places. Some, Some try to find happiness through material things or their achievements. And many try to find happiness through their relationships with other people. But knowing that all these things and people are temporary, therefore we know that our happiness is only fleeting. It's only temporary. Because people come and go. Even the people we love and those who love us will not always be there with us. We realize this more during this pandemic. And We cannot always go to our favorite places. We experience that also because of the lockdown. And the material things offer only momentary happiness. After receiving our orders during the 5-5 sale, after a few weeks, they don't make us happy anymore and we look forward to the next sale, either 6-6 or 7-7 or whatever. So, Making these things our source of joy will only lead to disappointment. That is why New Testament joy is anchored in no one else but in Christ and our relationship with Him. Joy is possible because we have been reconciled to our God and Creator. Not because of our own work or righteousness or obedience, but solely because of the grace of God. An undeserved gift the gift of His only Son, Jesus, through whom we have been bestowed righteousness and resurrection through His death and sacrifice on the cross. You know, interestingly, the Greek word for joy is kara. Kara. It comes from the Greek word charis, which means grace. And from here we can see that joy comes from Receiving the grace of God through Jesus Christ. And this cannot be taken away from us because of Jesus, we can come before God anytime through His Word and find encouragement, find strength, peace, find healing, power, and even life. And it brings joy that the world cannot give us. That is why some say joy is grace recognized. Joy is grace recognized. Brothers and sisters, let me ask you, where do you find joy? 
What is your source of joy? You know, the Bible tells us of only one place, one person who can give us true joy. And that is Jesus Christ. The question is, do you know Him? Do you have a relationship with Him? Do you spend time with Him? Because let me tell you, without Him, you wouldn't find true joy in life, especially in times of suffering and hardship. But in Christ, there is always reason to rejoice. In Christ, there is always reason to rejoice. After understanding where to find joy, let us move to the next question. The next question is, when to rejoice? When can we rejoice? When is a good time to rejoice in the Lord? You know, Paul's answer to that is, there are no good time to rejoice in the Lord because it is always the best time to rejoice in the Lord. That is why Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always. Always. You know, some Christians can only rejoice in the Lord when things are going well, when there are no problems in life, when everyone is healthy, when, everything are, uh, uh, when things are easy. But when things go rough, we leave God. We curse God and try to find happiness somewhere else. You know, we may think that Paul was in a good situation. The Philippian church was supporting him. That is why he can say easily, rejoice. But as I mentioned early, earlier, Paul's situation wasn't easy at all. It wasn't. He was under house arrest awaiting trial, and he was facing possible execution. He has enemies left and right, both inside and outside the ministry. And yet he kept on saying that he rejoices. Why is that? Let us look at all of his reasons. In the first chapter, Paul mentioned that he was imprisoned. But he wants the Philippian believers to understand that he, he rejoices in his imprisonment. In Philippians 1 verse 12 to 13, he says, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. You see, because Paul's joy is in Christ, even though he is imprisoned, he can rejoice because people are coming to know Jesus through his imprisonment. And not only that, other Christians are becoming bold in sharing the gospel because of his imprisonment. So as you can see, even in the midst of persecution, Paul rejoices. Then in verse 15 to 17, Paul mentioned some opposition within the faith against him. In Philippians 1 verse 15 to 17, he says, Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of rivalry, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. You see, there were people sharing the gospel with the wrong motives. They are trying to compete with Paul, thinking that he will feel bad that they are sharing the gospel more because he is stuck in prison. But as we can see, this was not the case. Even though they are sharing the gospel to try to piss off Paul, Paul is not pissed. Instead, he is rejoicing that Christ is preached to others. And in Philippians 1 verse 18 is his response. He says, What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that... I rejoice. So, in persecution, Paul rejoices. In opposition, Paul rejoices. But not only that, even in the face of execution, Paul continues to rejoice. In verse 18, he says, Yes, 
and I will rejoice. And then, continuing in verse 20 to 21, he says, As it is, my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. You see, whether in a life of suffering or death, Paul rejoices. In suffering, he rejoices because he sees it as a privilege to suffer for the sake of Christ. And he rejoices in death because he can be with Christ. Actually, when you read through it, Paul sounded quite funny because he cannot choose which one is better. He rejoices in both. You see, following Paul's life and attitude in Christ, we can rejoice always, even in the midst of opposition, persecution, or even execution. You know, lately, because of this pandemic, I have been feeling dismayed, discouraged, and frustrated at times. The pandemic, which started out as numbers to me, started to become names of people I know. And there's, I get frustrated that there's so little I can do to help or the church can do to help. And just in the past month, I have attended a number of memorial services in Zoom. But I was surprised because instead of feeling more sad in attending these memorial services, I was surprised that every time I attended one, my spirit was being uplifted. I was encouraged by the life of these faithful brothers and sisters in Christ who have experienced the love of Christ and lived out their lives to make Christ known until the very end, even after they're gone. Of course, I'm not happy that they pass away. I was still hoping to see them when the church reopens in physical worship. But you know, it brought me joy and encouragement knowing how they came to know Christ and how Christ has made an impact in and through their lives. You know, even being the minister of this church, a minister of this church, I was the one being ministered to. That is the power of Christ which brings joy. I'm not saying that when in Christ there's no room to feel sad or to grieve. On the contrary, when we grieve in our Lord, that is where we can find comfort and eventually joy, even through heartaches. For in Psalm 34 verse 18, it says, The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. And our Lord Jesus tells us in Matthew 11:28, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Brothers and sisters, in Jesus, there's always reason to rejoice. Even in the midst of suffering, whether be it through opposition, persecution, or even execution, if you are in Christ, there's always reason to rejoice. Now that we understand where to find joy and when can we experience joy in the Lord, let us ask the question, how can we live in joy in our everyday lives? How can we practice rejoicing in Christ? You know, it's easy to say rejoice in the Lord, but how do we do it? How can we make rejoicing in the Lord practical in our everyday lives? Here's a few things. And the first thing and the most obvious thing we can do is to rejoice by growing in our relationship with God. Rejoice by growing in our relationship with Christ. Paul tells us of the surpassing greatness of knowing Jesus Christ. And so that is what we should do. Know Christ. And the best way to do this is by reading the Scripture, reading God's Word every day. Because God's Word points us to Christ. Do your quiet time and spend time with God, reading His Word. And as you are reminded about God, or as you continue to know more about how faithful Jesus is, 
then joy will eventually follow. Then, couple your scripture reading with thanksgiving and prayer. In, four, in, uh, in Philippians 4, verse 6 to 7, Paul says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. You see, prayer helps lift all our worries and fix our eyes on God. Prayer is an acknowledgement that God is bigger than our problems and turns our worries into trust and then eventually joy. So rejoice by growing in your relationship with Christ. That is why Paul reminds us in verse 5, he says, The Lord is at hand. The Lord is at hand. What is the, what is the meaning here? Actually, he's being ambiguous. Paul is not only pointing that Jesus is coming back soon, but also that Jesus is with us. He is near us. And those, tr- those two truths, that Jesus is coming back and Jesus is with us, should bring us joy. The second thing we can do is to rejoice in fellowship with one another. Paul talks of rejoicing by reuniting with the Philippians even if it was not guaranteed. In Philippians 1, verse 25 to 26, he says, Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. And then he tells the Philippians to rejoice in reuniting with one of their brothers, Epaphroditus. In Philippians 2, verse 28 to 29, he says, I am more eager to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing seeing him again, and that I may be less anxious. So receive him in the Lord with all joy and honor such men. So, we too must rejoice by continuing in fellowship with one another, even during this pandemic. I know we cannot meet in person, but we can continue to meet virtually through Zoom. I know it's not as nice, but it is still a source of edification and encouragement and joy when we meet even through Zoom. So, continue to meet with your small group and your church barcadas. Share your encouragement and pray for one another. That is one of the blessings of being in Christ because in Him, we are all one big family. So, let us not waste the opportunity. Let us rejoice by having fellowship with one another even if it is just virtually for the meantime. There are so many other ways to rejoice in the Lord like singing praises to Him and worshiping together with your family. But, what I want to emphasize last is to rejoice by ministering to others. Rejoice by ministering to others. We can do this by helping out those who are struggling. We can help out maybe through financial help or it could be as simple as through prayer. You know, it is not only the pastor's job to minister to others. If you are a Christian, if you are a follower of Christ, then you are a minister to others. And when we partner in ministering to others in the name of our Lord, then we can rejoice because we are, being, are becoming partners in the work of our Lord. You know, Paul talks about his joy when his beloved church, the Philippians, supports him and partners with him in his ministry. But he wants to make it clear that he was not just being happy that they supplied his needs because he has already learned to be contented with what he has. Instead, he tells them that he rejoices for their sake. He rejoices that the Philippians can take part in the ministry of God. Look at what he says in Philippians 4, verse 17 to 18. He says, Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. 
I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you have sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. We can rejoice in the Lord when we continually partner in the ministry of helping others. We can do this by supporting missionaries and small churches as well. And you can support them by giving through our missions offering every week. You know, our church supports many missionaries and their ministry. So as a church, UECP can be to the missionaries what, Philippian, what the Philippian church was to Paul, partners in the ministry. And in that privilege, in that opportunity, we should rejoice. These are some ways we can rejoice in the Lord, especially in this time of pandemic. Brothers and sisters, as we close the book of Philippians, let me ask you, got joy? Do you have joy in your life? Or are you living in sorrow and despair? Let me remind all of us once again that in Christ, there is always reason to rejoice. Even in the midst of suffering, there is reason to rejoice when your source of joy is our Lord Jesus Christ. We don't know yet when this pandemic will end. We don't know if things will go back to what we are used to. You see, life will continue to change for better or for worse. But there's one thing that is constant. There is only one solid rock in our lives that we can depend on. And that is our Lord Jesus. And if you put your hope in Him, then you will find joy in life. And you can rejoice even in the midst of this pandemic. Because in Christ, there's always reason to rejoice. So you ECP... Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let us pray. Father in heaven, indeed, we can rejoice because you have given us the greatest gift of all, the gift of your Son, Jesus, through whom we have righteousness, through whom we receive salvation, through whom we, can re we are reconciled back to you. Father, in this time of pandemic, so many people are suffering. So many people are buried in sorrow. But Father, we know, and you have reminded us today, that joy comes from knowing Jesus. So our prayer is that the people, the people of this world suffering during this pandemic let them know Jesus. Reveal your Son to them that they may know that there is a God who loves them, who saves them, who comforts them, who heals them, who gives them life and gives them joy. Father, I pray that you will help us, the church, to bring this joy to others. Help us not only to know Jesus, and to make Him our joy, but help us to pass on this joy to others, telling them about the God who came to this earth to save them and to bring joy in their life, even in the midst of suffering. Help us to continually pray and thank You for all the things that You give us. And help us to rejoice but by partnering in the ministry, in Your ministry the ministry of joy giving, of joy giving to others. So Father, we thank you once again and we pray that indeed we can live a life of joy just as Paul tells us to rejoice in our Lord. Help us to indeed find our joy in Jesus Christ alone. This is our prayer. In his mighty name, amen and amen.
Ephesians 2.12 says that to be without Christ is to be without hope. To live without Christ is to live in a state of uncertainty, with little expectation of the future, and with no real solutions to life's most difficult challenges. Much of the world exists in this state of hopelessness. But to find hope in the person of Jesus Christ is to find hope in its purest form. Hope in Christ is more than a momentary respite from pain, more than a wish of things to come. It is true and lasting. It provides us with a strong and assured expectation of what God has promised, and it changes who we are and how we live. This hope is part of our salvation. It provides power for living. It gives us joy. It gives us protection. It gives us strength and boldness. It gives us comfort and peace. It gives us confidence in ministry. As children of God, we abound in the hope of Jesus Christ, daily experiencing the blessing of calling Him Savior. If we believe His Word is alive and absolute, we should not be able to contain the hope inside of us. With every Bible we place, with every scripture we distribute, and with every word of witness we share, we offer true and lasting hope in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. And as long as there are people in the world who do not know Jesus, who do not have hope, our work is not finished. What are you waiting for? Register your kids now to join our Vacation Bible School entitled Maker Fun Factory. You can register through the link below or by scanning the QR code. Let us receive the benediction. May the love of God, our Heavenly Father, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Spirit be with us and be our source of joy. Amen and Amen. Mm -hmm.